Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay and I'm here to talk to you about Turkey. Once a model for the Islamic world, now reduced to a military power project. Not too long ago, Turkey used to be a modern and secular state, an Islamic republic with a progressive approach, thanks to the policies of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the father of modern-day Turkey, a reformer who brought his country at par with the European world. He replaced Arabic with the Latin script, the Islamic calendar with the Western calendar, mosques were under state control, faith was a private matter. Christians and Jews could freely worship their gods in Turkey. Turkish men were forbidden from wearing a headgear. Turkish women forbidden from wearing headscarves. But the Turkey of today is very different. Now Turkey is ruled by a leader who wants to take his country back to its Ottoman ambitions. He wants to run it like a modern day Sultan. The name of this leader is Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He has controlled Turkey for 17 long years first as Prime Minister and now as President. In these 17 years, he has made Turkey an autocracy and installed himself on moral high ground. President Erdogan preaches the world on what's right and what isn't. But does he practice it himself? Let's burst his bubble. The Turkish President claims to practice strict Muslim values and lead a humble life. This is his humble abode. A 1,000-room palace built at a cost of $615 million, 1,000 rooms. Erdogan's home is 30 times bigger than the White House in Washington. He travels the world in multi-million dollar jets tailored to his preferences. His wife, Amin Erdogan, the first lady of Turkey, carries handbags worth at least 50,000 US dollars on these foreign trips. And since we're discussing foreign trips, let me also tell you a bit about Erdogan's style of diplomacy. Exceptional. He traveled to Washington DC in 2017. He was greeted by protesters. Erdogan was furious, so much so that he unleashed his bodyguards on them. They punched, kicked and choked demonstrators as the Turkish president watched. If he could pull that off on American soil, imagine what he does to dissenters in Turkey. Well, you don't have to imagine, we'll tell you. In 2016, Turkey witnessed the bloodiest coup attempt in its political history. The Turkish military, which believes that its core mission is to keep Turkey secular, launched a coordinated operation to unseat an increasingly divisive and dictatorial Erdogan. Soldiers and tanks rolled down the streets. A number of explosions rang out in Ankara and Istanbul. Turkish fighter jets dropped bombs on their own parliament. For a moment, it looked like the coup would succeed, but it failed. Erdogan mobilized the public via social media. Tens of thousands of his supporters hit the streets. They defeated the coup leaders in a matter of hours. But they had no idea what was about to follow. Erdogan got 160,000 people detained for questioning, 1,60,000. Out of these, 77,000 people were jailed on charges of terror. This included military personnel, police officials, journalists, teachers, academics, activists, lawmakers, judges and prosecutors. According to Turkey Purge, a website which tracks Turkey's post-coup crackdown, more than 500,000 people have been investigated since 2016, 96,000 people have been put behind bars, 1,50,000 people have been dismissed from their jobs, some 3,000 schools and universities have been shut, and a total of 189 media outlets have been shut down in Turkey. Four years since this massive crackdown, and Erdogan feels that he's entitled to do as he wishes. So he's converting museums and cathedrals into mosques. The conversion of Hagia Sophia was just the tip of the iceberg. The Turkish regime is undertaking a series of conversions. Churches, museums, music, cinema, culture, almost everything is being Islamicized. Then we come to the minorities in Turkey. They're under attack. Ethnic Kurds that make up one quarter of Turkey's population are being suppressed in all sorts of ways. The Kurds cannot write university dissertations in Kurdish. In some parts, it is illegal for parents to give their child a Kurdish name. Several Kurdish cities along Turkey's border regions have been destroyed without the slightest protest from the international community. And that's not all. Today's Turkey is chasing new conquests, even if that involves complete violation of international law. President Erdogan is following Xi Jinping's playbook of expansionism. Turkey is provoking its neighbors by claiming disputed territories and waters. 
It is currently engaged in a fierce face-off with Greece. They found new energy deposits in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Turkey wants all of it. The Turkish president wants to reclaim the lost glory of the Ottoman Turks. And he wants the world to witness it. The Turkish propaganda machine is producing TV shows that tell you a lot about Erdogan's approach, his thought process. The Prime Minister of Pakistan considers Erdogan his role model. So he invites the Turkish president to Islamabad to give lectures to India on how to treat minorities. In February 2020, this year, Erdogan addressed a joint session of Pakistan's parliament. He tried justifying Islamabad's cross-border terrorism in Kashmir. He accused India of making Kashmiris suffer. And this was not the first time he did something like this. The Turkish president has never wasted an opportunity to question India's secular credentials. Let me give you another example. The same month, February 2020, communal riots had rocked New Delhi. There was violence from both sides. Do you know what the Turkish president said? He called India a country where the massacre of Muslims was widespread, a country which will fail to make global peace a possibility, a country which calls itself strong because of its large population, but is not. How does the Indian Foreign Ministry respond to all this? It issues statements. How do we, Indian citizens, react? We question Indian actors for meeting the Turkish First Lady. I'm sure you remember these images. They caused quite a stir in the Indian media. There was a lot of political grandstanding, but I must show you something else. A tweet by the Indian ambassador to Turkey. He retweeted these images and called the meeting a quote-unquote special moment. And for the actor in question, he called him India's cultural ambassador to Turkey. The point I'm making is quite simple. The Turkish president is no friend of India. He won't stop meddling in India's internal affairs. India has the second largest number of Muslims in the world. And Erdogan wants to be seen as the leader of Muslims across the world. He has made Islam the center of Turkish politics and the guiding light of Turkey's foreign policy. The prize he wants in return is for Turkey to replace Saudi Arabia as the de facto leader of the Islamic world. He is running a carefully crafted campaign to achieve this dream.